So here we have, the, I will start, I will basically continue the lectures that we had in the first week. If you remember, we had two lectures, the Feynman Calculus lectures. And also the QSD lectures by John Kulchak. And we, have, we basically didn't have time to really make a connection between the two. So in the beginning of these uh, two le four lectures that we will have today and tomorrow, I would first like to make the, what is the connection between these two lectures. So here we use the same on rules to calculate cross sections, but in the QSD lectures we didn't have time to drive with these same on rules. So I will just first mention how we derive the same on rules. And then, well, considering that we have that we had spent like six, seven hours in the first week on this course, more than that. And then I will mention why these don't work. So you have spent so much time that these approaches do not work. In QCD. So then, what we will do? Well, I will just briefly mention some of the approaches. There is the alternative approach that one is the lattice calculation. Well, I'm not an expert on this lattice calculation, so I will just briefly mention what it is, what the, what the problems are, and what it resolves. Then there is the ADS CFE correspondence, which has been mentioned by the elect by our lecture. Today, and there will be detailed lectures on this by Ulf Gersoy. And there is a sum of approach, depending on how much time we seem to have, I will go to some detail in this approach. And finally, there are this using the symmetry, and this vision, or as the effective field theory, and tidal perturbation theory. Where in the, well, the symmetry, the advantage of the symmetry is if you know that there is a symmetry, you can basically relate physical observables without very good using any perturbative calculation. And this effective field theory is an approach in which you do not really work with QCD, and but you work with what you what we really observe rather than working with quarks. You can work with the like the proton and the ions, the neutron, and one of the well established approaches in effective field theory is the pyro perturbation theory, which basically deals with mainly with the pions, pions and the, the suit scaling mesons. Now, if you remember in the QFD lectures, one of the objects that we had uh, studied was the two point function. Which was defined in the scalar field theory as the time order product of two scalar field operators. And if you remember the definition of this time ordering, it basically makes sure that to this state, first the operator that has the previous time acts. So this time ordering product, phi of x, phi of y, this is equal to phi of x, phi of y, f, y0 is less than x0, stating that if this y operator has a previous time, then it should act first. Or it is phi of y and phi of x if x0 is less than y0. Now here, you might end up having a minus sign. If these, op these field operators are fermions, So if you have a fermion field, under the exchange of these field operators, you have to include the minus sign. This is the definition of the time ordering product. But you can generalize this to any function. So you can define a, a general endpoint function. And the value of expectation value of the time ordered product of n fields. Of this one to this one. 
So the first question is, what do we do with these? I mean, why, why do we even need these? Now, there's a big theory. Uh, okay, so, now before going on, let, let me just first state the big theory. So this theorem allows us to express any endpoint function in terms of various two-point functions in a non-interacting theory. This is essential. If you have a non-interacting theory, in that case, we can write this endpoint function is equal to the sum of all possible combinations of two-point functions. So, to say what do we really mean by the sum of all possible uh, two-point functions, let us do an example. Let us consider the lacking expectation value of the four point function. Now, what are the, four, the all possible two point functions that we can construct in these uh, product of four operators? Well, we can just consider the, as I said, this combination. So we can consider the two-point function of 5x1 and 5x3 and 5x2 and 5x4. So that is one contribution. So this is equal to zero. If I write down the contribution from this term, 
Again, I have these four points. I'm connecting point one with point two, point three with point four. Now, this is the diagram corresponding to this term. And so, if you look at the last one, I'm connecting point one and point four. I'm connecting point two and point three. So these are the all possible contributions to this four bit function, four point function. And each of these lines just give me a factor of this two point because I should write down the corresponding two point function. Now if you remember the form of this two point function, you had evaluated this two-point function in the QFD lectures, and you have shown that this is equal to d4t divided by 2 pi to the 4 This was your four-point function. So for each line appearing over here, you have to write a factor like this. And that, okay, so you just multiply the contributions of different terms. So if you go to the momentum space, then these are all in coordinate space, but you can do the calculation in momentum space. So this, this will be the contribution that you should have right. And if you remember, this is, we didn't write it down, but this denominator p squared minus m squared is kind of common to all particle propagate, the disk of the whole property. So the propagators that we use in our Feynman calculus, Feynman rules, are nothing but the Fourier transform of our two-point functions. Are you going to try them? You already did that last week. Oh, okay. I will, well, in a few minutes I will drive this using some other approach. If you remember in the field theory lecture what you did was you had second quantized these fields, wrote an expansion, a Fourier series for these uh, Fourier transform for these fields in terms of annihilation creation operators and calculate using the commutation relation you obtain this operator. Now, of course, since we, we theorem is valid for a non-interacting theory, it's not so interesting. What's the four-point function? We have a one, uh, one function out of them, and you take down the uh, double groups. For example, uh, we have a three-point function. Okay, so if you write a three-point function, we have just stated that you have to contract all the fields. So if you contract any two, the third one is left, so this is zero. In a non-interacting theory, I don't know hmm? This three-point function is zero. In a non-interacting theory. All, all, all number of points, functions are zero? Yes. Now I will include the interactions. And then we will see that the three-point function for any endpoint function is non-zero. Now, of course, this non-interacting theory is not interesting for us. So we would like to study the interacting theory. Now, we can, in general, prove that if you have an endpoint function of an interacting theory, this is equal to Now, if 
let's, let's do an example. Let's study your three-point function appearing over here in the interacting theory. In a 5 to 4 theory. Let us assume that we have this log parameter. We have a real scalar field. And we have this y to 4 curve. What will be our frequency function in this field? I 
by V connecting X1 and X. And then I have a factor of V. I can, if I look at this one, X2, I have this X2, I can contract it with this one or this one. So there are two possibilities. And both possibilities will give me the same answer. So this is a 2D X2 and X. And once I carry out these two contractions, the only possibility left is this one. And it gives me a D X3 and X. Now this, the reason why we usually insert a 3 factorial or a 4 factorial in this term is that so I should touch that the 3 factorial has cancelled this 3 and 2. Well, this is not the only possible contraction. We also have other possibilities. Let me erase this one. Now, this 5x1, I have to consider all possible contractions that I can have now. So, I have to construct this one with one of these fields appearing over here. But I can con contract it with either this one, or this one, or this one. But these are all the same fields. So whether I contract it with this one, or this one, or this one, it will give me the same contribution. So I write just one of them, and multiply the result by three. Now, of course, in this term, I assume that I contract all of these fields with something appearing over here. I could have as well contracted this one with, let's say, this one. It will give me a factor of plus i, one over three factorial. Okay, these two contraction gives me <coughs> x1, x2. And then I have, well, this I have to contract with any one, I can contract with any one of these. It will give me a factor of 2, 2 because, no, a 3. 3 because there are 3 possible choices which are identical. It will give this the same contribution, d, x3, and x. And there is one possibility left. Three cancel this this one, and I end up having a factor of two. So the other possibility is okay. I can con contract this x one with x three, and this x two with this one, or I can contract I don't know this x two and x three and this x one with one of these one. There are two other choices. Oh, right. the, the basic idea is the same. Now we can write down the corresponding contribution or draw the diagram. So let's start with the first one. So what do we have? We have the x1 x2 and x3. These are fixed. These are given in my endpoint function. So all of these x1, x2, and x3 are connected to the same point x. So this is my point x. This is the diagram that corresponds to this one. Or if you look at one of these, plus I have x1, x2, and x3. So what happens is x1 is connected with x2. x3 is connected to x. And x is connected to x. This is the diagram corresponding to that. If you consider the other ones, the other diagrams that we, the term that we didn't write, x1, x2, x3, plus x1, x2, x3, x. So these are all possible diagrams at lowest order. So if you just look at what are the corresponding expressions, for each line, 
may have a factor of the propagator. For each line connecting two points. So that is one of the Feynman rules. You draw the diagram. If there is a line connecting two points, you write down the propagator. And we, have, we also have an additional factor, I lambda. I lambda arises because of this term over here, the phi cube term. It is this interaction term in our Lagrangian. So this is this coefficient over here. So you just write down the factor of I lambda. Now, if you would have considered the four point function, okay, your homework, calculate the first correction. So, four point function. There is a zero order term and which we have already drawn the possible uh, just grade. And then there is the first correction, which will be due to this part. So the, the, how to draw this same on diagrams, since we are summing over all possible contractions, it just basically states us draw all possible diagrams that have the given number of vertices. So here what we did was we had this Taylor expansion over here. We just Taylor, we had the exponential, we Taylor expanded it. When we Taylor expanded it, at the, in the first term of the expansion, there is one factor of phi cube and phi to the four. In the second term, there are two factors, so which correspond, which will, will give us two vertices. And in the third term, there will be, we'll have three vertices and so on. Now, of course, these, in these diagrams, x1, x2, and x3, they are fixed. But x is free, so that's why x can be any point. So that's why we have this x integration over here. They arise from the theory. They are there. Well, they have divergences. They they, they diverge. If, they, if, if you remember, we had when we quantized the theory, we had the infinite ground state energy, zero point vibration. These are also similar terms. So we just get rid of them. We will get rid of them. And if you look at this, these diagrams, they're not really interesting if you are if we are considering scattering processes. I mean if you look at this one, this, this particle isn't interacting with this other particle. So that's not what we are measuring anyway. Those three point five uh, interacting uh, Isn't it because of this? No, these are non-zero. The the, well, this is an interactive theory. But uh, we made it kind of non-interactive. I mean, okay. we wrote the exponential term, that okay. all, the, all those individual terms in the expansion are non-interactive. Okay, but this doesn't come from the three-point function. That, that contribution arises from the six-point function. Why 3.1 interactive function is zero? Well, why is it zero? Why it is zero? Why, why, why? So, you can only consider one of the contractions. This contraction is just a number. I erased it. It's, it's, a, it's a number. It's an integral. It's not an operator. So, as an operator, what remains is this one. So, if you can remember the expansion of this field operator in terms of annihilation creation operators, this is just a sum over the momentum vacuum A, A from exponential, plus vacuum A degree. Some other exponential. Both of these terms are zero, but that's why the three points. But uh, these are divergent, we usually set them to zero. Now let us look at the connection between the endpoint function and the scattering amplitude. 
I should be already obvious. Uh, if, if within this theory we were to study, let's say, some part of the day dissociation to B and C, so what would have been our frame on diagram? We have, a, we have this box. We have one ingoing particle, two outgoing particles. We have to fill inside. What can we use to fill the interior of this box? Either such vertices from this high to cube term or these vertices. And since we have four field operators, these correspond to vertices like this one. So these are our building blocks to fill in that cube. The easiest one would be just to use this part, this part of the puzzle, and then this guy. These are scalars. But how would we have written down the corresponding amplitude? It would be, okay, we, there are no formulas here. So you can just write any term that you like. We have an outgoing scalar. And for scalars, we just write one. One outgoing scalar, another outgoing scalar, another out ingoing scalar, it is also one. These are just the wave functions of the scalar, the scale of the plane waves, I said, the coefficient of the plane waves. And now we have this vertex, and the vertex is just this term, I love that. So the invariant amplitude for this process in this theory is just this part. But this we can easily obtain from this diagram by just removing the external legs and replacing the external legs with the wave functions of the corresponding part, ingoing or outgoing. Now let us look at a similar example in QED. We, have, we are already familiar with QED, with the calculations of QED. So it will probably be more obvious for you. Question before we proceed by that. These are also diagrams. But the difference of these diagrams from the diagrams that we draw for the uh, scattering amplitudes is that in the scattering amplitude calculation, we have ingoing and outgoing particles. In this one, we don't have the ingoing and outgoing particles. We already start with some points. And we have to connect all these points in all possible ways. The rest is just identical to this one. You can imagine these diagrams as the scattering amplitude diagram with external legs also attached to the points. Why do we consider the construction one by one? I mean, there can be uh, I mean, three simultaneous constructions, I mean, for instance. Well, this is what the theorem tells us. It tells me that any endpoint function can be written as the sum of pairwise constructions. That is the theory. Now let us look at the problem of the e minus v minus e plus e plus scattering. We have already written down the corresponding uh, scattering amplitude for this process. Now for the four-point function that we relevant four-point function is that we have an electron and the muon field and the positron. E minus V minus. So these are bars. These correspond to these particles appearing over here. And these correspond to the final state part. So I'm first creating my electron and muon, and then I'm just I'm annihilating them at some other point. This I want to calculate in the interacting theory. So this I can write as this 
This is the interaction of the electron plus this is the interaction of the neon. with my electromagnetic field. If I make an expansion of this exponential, I have I end up having this piece plus The notation, whenever we are working with the neon, your notation kind of gets... Uh, the word that comes into my mind is idiotic. You have this 4 minus... This neon is the Lorentz index. This is 1, 2, 3, 4. No, 0, 1, 2, 3. This neon, it just states that this is the field for the neon, the part. So it's not an index. Plus, of course, the remaining term. Sorry, new bar. 
just gives you how to relate the endpoint function to suitable scattering or decay amplitude. Z is Simon. Hmm? Z is Simon. Z Simon. Z Simon. Okay. <laughs> There's also this possibility. You have the muon, it emits a photon, and then there is the there's just a single fermion loop appearing here, and the electron just proceeds without uh, it doesn't doesn't have an anything over there. In principle, these diagrams exist, but this diagram is a disconnected diagram, and we are not really interested in this one. And here also, there is one thing which I use, which I didn't mention. If you look at the two-point function that you can construct from two fermions, here I always consider contraction from a uh, fermionic field with the conjugate field. Which is this one, if you look at elect psi electron and psi electron bar. This is the only non-zero term. So if you consider the contraction of two fermionic fields or the contraction of two conjugate fields, these are both zero. Now, the lesson of all this story is that, okay, once we derive the Feynman rules, and we had shown that, okay, the last week for us the important object was the scattering matrix element, but now we can, the, the same information is also carried by the end function, endpoint function. But there are certain assumptions that we made up here and over here. One thing is we have the exponential, we are expanding it, we are we are expanding it in a table series and just summing one or two terms. For an exact calculation, you have to sum all of them. But for practical reasons, you cannot really calculate more than a few terms in this index expansion in most of the cases. But if you are, if you have a function, any function, it can be an endpoint function. And if you make a Taylor, it has some dependences. As I in general, in the QCD, your expansion parameter is alpha appearing over here. So we are just calculating the theta expansion around alpha equal to zero. By these Feynman calculus, what we are actually doing are calculating these coefficients of various terms in the alpha expansion. So in QED, if you do a calculation in QED, we know that alpha QED, the fine structure constant of QED is of the order of 10 to the power minus 2. It's just 1%. And 
for naturally, it will, we would expect these coefficients to be of the same order of magnitude if you properly calculate it, properly normalize it. But if they are only of the same order of magnitude, so this is due to this coefficient, this term, the contribution of this term, if there is a contribution from here, the contribution of this term is 1% of this one. If, there is, if this is zero, and you get the contribution from here, contribution of this term is 1% of this term. And the next term is just 1% of the previous term. Every term is one person gives a contribution that is around 1% of the previous term. So then the question is how precise do you want the, your result to be? If you want a result that is valid up to let's say, a few percent, then you just calculate the first correction, and the rest will not change your result. So you can just ignore them. But if you look at QC, QCD, depending on which energy scale, scale you are studying your system, the fine structure constant is of the order of 1. So it's getting reduced. Hmm? It's getting reduced when the energy is increasing. Now, we have already studied the running coupling constant of QED. We didn't give in the numbers. But if you we had shown that at a scale Q squared, this is given by some alpha mu squared, where 1 minus alpha <coughs> Q squared is what you want, like this up to one loop order. And this pi, renormalized pi, this was equal to if, let's say, minus Q squared. This is equal to zero at the scale Q squared is equal to mu squared. This is how we have defined it here. Now, if you do the same calculation in QCD, in QED, we had just the at first first non-zero order to this term. We had just a single diagram. In QED, this was the only diagram we had. But in QCD, you had the lecture last week, and there. The QCD is a theory in which the gluons also interact with themselves, with gluons. Gluons also carry color charge. So in QCD, we have a similar diagram whose effect is exactly the same. This screens the color, the electric charge, and this diagram also screens the color charge. But we also have additional diagrams. We have this diagram in QCD. And we also have this one. These are the additional diagrams which arise because the gluons in QCD, they also carry the color charge. And this is screening. This gives a screening effect. So that if you look at, at farther distances, the electric, the cup, if this was the only in QED, for example, this is the only diagram. The further away you look at the coupling constant, the smaller it becomes. And these diagrams give the anti screening. So these just tell you that if you are further away, the coupling strength that you see will be even larger. And in QCD, with the quark content that it has, we can write down the fine structure constant of QCD as a function of the momentum squared. It is just alpha. This is proportional to let's say one over logarithm of minus Q squared divided by lambda QC. It has such a form. Can you explain more? Explicit screen again, unsecret from this variable. Well, it's basically when you calculate the coefficients, this brings a minus sign, this brings a plus sign. This contributes with minus sign, this contributes with plus sign. So there's a competition between these two con contributions. And in QCD with SU3 and the quark content, it has it is this one that wins over this one. Now, physically, what's going on? is 
as you remember your courses on dielectric, you have a dielectric. You, if you put some charge, it will polarize the medium. If you put some positive charge, so the negative charge will be closer to this positive charge, and the positive charges are further away. So these negative charges in the near vicinity, they tend to reduce the charge that you observe, the strength that you observe. So this is this is exactly the same effect. You can ask, so what in the screening case, what are we polarizing? But remember, the diagram that we considered is the one in which there is a photon, and the photon just splits into an electron positron pair, and then it is you can consider such a diagram. So in the vacuum, it does have electron positron pair, it has a dipole, and that is what the charge you put in the vacuum polarizes. And in the case of the anti-screening effect, so this is the, the effect of these diagrams. And in the anti-screening case, what we have is, if you put some charge here, and you look at it from some distance, if it emits a glow, and which divide into more gluons. Well, the gluons carry charge, so there appears more charge, more objects here that have the charge, or that that can interact with something appearing over here. So it kind of anti strain. The further away you go, the larger the strength, the field, the coupling strength you feel. Magnetism. Maybe, but uh, the effect is similar, let's say. Now, but there's another problem over here. This one, the QCD, is around 280. So, okay, if we are at high energies, where this minus Q squared is a large number, in that case, the alpha QCD becomes small. So, in high energy experiments, we can, we can do a Failure expansion. But as you go to lower energies, when Q squared gets close to this 200 dB limit, this alpha QCD just diverges. And there's nothing. Okay, there are certain divergences which we can eliminate using your pre normalization. And this is not one of them. So it just grows. It just, in fact, tells us that as Q squared goes to smaller and smaller values, at some point the perturbation theory just breaks down. We cannot really use it. This is the perturbative result. So after some point, this just becomes unreliable. So perturbation theory is not valid anymore. Now another problem is, if you take any function and make a Taylor expansion, you are by definition assuming that the function is, uh, analytic function of this, around this point, alpha equals to zero. So if you are close to the point alpha equals to zero, either slightly larger or slightly smaller, it means that nothing really changes significantly. The changes are very small. That's an assumption that you make when you make the Taylor expansion. But if you consider alpha, well, if for alpha, we have alpha positive. So we have the opposite charges attracting each other, negative charges repelling each other. If alpha would change sign, this would completely change. So the same charges will repel and double the charges will attract. Same charges will attract, alpha the charges will repel. So there will be a drastic change between alpha larger than zero and alpha smaller than zero. So it just tells us that alpha equal to zero is not an analytic point of our scattering amplitude, in a sense. So we cannot really make this expansion. It just it, this expansion, in the case of field theory, is, is an asymptotic expansion. And the properties of the asymptotic expansions are that as you increase the calculated terms, if you consider just one leading term, the next leading term, the next one, next leading term, and so on, if the exact value of your function is given by this value, and this is the ordering expansion, The more terms you add to your expansion, you get closer, closer to the real value. But
but after some time, it just starts growing. So the best you can do is this one. And you have to stop adding more terms at a given level. Because if you keep on adding more terms and more terms, you just go away from this value. How do we specify that point? Hmm? How do we specify? You just need to calculate the terms. Uh, the, these terms, each order, it becomes smaller and smaller, smaller, and when it, the calculated term it becomes larger and larger, it means you are now in zero. So you have to add terms as long as each calculated term is smaller than the previous one. If they start the each calculated term becomes larger than the previous one, then you are likely in this range. This was another problem with this perturbation the theory. Uh, theory. Now another thing, another problem is we know that in certain theories at least there are contributions that go like this. Can you please repeat how how we do the uh, analysis, analysis of the iPhone We don't have the analysis flows. It's not an analytic point. We are making an expansion flows to all, at all p equals to zero, but since it's not an analytic function at that point, we know that the series we obtain is an asymptotic series. It approaches the real value and then it starts diverging after some time. And another, another problem in our contributions like this which are, these contributions arise from what we call instant ones. Which you will have lectured on instant ones by a jump. Now the problem here is, if you try to make a perturbative expansion of this, this uh, exponential, a Taylor expansion of this exponential, well if you calculate f of zero, alpha is zero, Say zero positive. This is just zero. Because this is e to the power minus infinity. e to the power minus infinity is zero. If you take the derivative, if you take the derivative with respect to alpha is all a over alpha squared e to the power minus a over alpha. And if you take the limit as alpha goes to zero, it goes to zero. In fact, if you consider any term, any derivative, and then take the limit, take alpha to zero, it will be zero. So if you try to calculate the coefficients of such a contribution in a Taylor expansion, the contribution will always be zero. So this basically states that if, for some, re for some reason, the calculated property has the, the quantity as such a contribution, this, this Feynman diagram expansion, the perturbative expansion, will never see these terms. You will not be aware of the contribution of these terms. Now, if alpha is small, alpha goes to, is close to zero, the contribution is zero, so there is no problem with that. There will not be a significant contribution. But if alpha is large, as in QCD, for example, if alpha is large, this will give a significant contribution to the calculated one, which is completely missed by the perturbation theory. <coughs> and in that case, we need some other tools to calculate these coefficients, this endpoint function. So in these situations, when we have such contributions, or when we are looking at small and low energy, low energy processes, then we cannot really avoid using some non-perturbative methods. And if you consider the hot run, okay, you can say, okay, in LAC we are just using high energy scattering, so why should we bother? But if you, even in LAC, what you measure is eventually hot run. So you send a proton, which is itself a hot run, and then quartz collide. That part you can calculate perturbatively, because the, when the parts collide, well, the relevant scale will be large. So you can do a perturbative calculation over there. But as the parts separate, their energy will 
the uh, sensor of mass and energy will drop, so you will get what we call the hydrolyzation. <coughs> if you have a quark moving in this direction, it should, by some process, pick up another un an anti quark to form a magnum. And the interaction between this quark and anti quark, the um, the momentum of this gluon will be low. So eventually, even in the LAC, you will end up having some, some, some quantity which can, should be calculated as low Q squared, which means that a non perturbative thing. So you cannot really avoid these non perturbative calculations as long as you are dealing with outcomes. They are also, uh, uh, this is kind of the color charge, the color coupling constant. The charge doesn't change, the charge is conserved, but the coupling constant changes. The mass also changes with scale. There are similar formulas for that. Electric coupling constant changes. Okay, so you should also make this distinction. The coupling constant and the charge are different things. Uh, for me, the electron and the charge are minus one. It doesn't have 0 0.03, it doesn't have anything else. It's just minus one. And the quark has charge, up quark has two thirds charge. It, this charge isn't two thirds times E, it's just two thirds. But when I'm calculating scattering cross sections, the coupling constant of the, the electromagnetic coupling constant of the, let's say, the electron is minus one times E. For the up quark, it is the charge times the coupling constant, that's two thirds times E. But the charge is Minus one, two thirds, or minus one third, minus two thirds. So this minus one doesn't change. It's fixed. But E does change as a change of energy scale. Similarly, mass. Mass also changes. By the way, there is, okay, we didn't cover this LSS reduction formula, but one, there is one thing that it also assumes. In this scattering amplitude, we assume that we send three particles together to each other, and they, they interact somehow here, and then after they leave the interaction region, they just move freely. Uh, it works perfectly for the electron, for the neon, for all the leptons. But if you go to the quark, we didn't even observe a single free quark. So you cannot really consider, I am sending a quark here, another quark over here, and colliding. Oh, it doesn't exist. The free quark doesn't exist. Over all paths that pass 
that connect this point to this point. With the weight given by determined by the action. Well, you can do the same thing for fields. So this endpoint function is just a sum, sum over all possible values of fields at the every space time point times 5x1, 5x10 is power i times the action. 1 divided by, let's put the z, z0, where this z0 is just the sum over all, pan, all field configuration is power i. Now, usually what is done is rather than if we just add a, a term to our action or to our Lagrangian e4 fix fx 5x Now the reason why we add this term is if I take the derivative with respect to j of the exponent I get this 5 in front of the exponent It's just like if you want to calculate the integral of minus x squared plus If you want to calculate this integral, I can just write this integral as minus x into pre infinity dx x to the power minus x squared plus ax. Of course, I should set a equal to 0. And this is nothing but so x squared to the n. And this is nothing but minus <coughs> a. Power n, because each derivative with respect to a will just give me a factor of n in front of the exponent of this integral. Now if I calculate this integral once, and by taking its for an arbitrary a, by taking its derivative and setting a equal to zero, I, I can obtain all of these. I do the same thing here. I just add this term. If I take the derivative with respect to j of x1 j of x1 each one of these derivatives will bring factors 5 of x1, 5 of x2 and 5 of x1 and what remains is just this one. What was B5 in our case? This one. All paths between which one? You can define as D5, the value of the field by at the point space time point x multiplied over all possible values of x. Now of course what you do here is you just just as in the case of the Schrodinger equation, the path integral for the Schrodinger equation, you first discretize your space time. Most, then in that case there will be a, uh, an infinite number of a countable infinite number of integration variables. In, you, if you can integrate over it, then take the limit on the this uh, discretization scale goes to zero. But does that sum bound goes to x1 and x1 and x1 goes to x1? Well, it doesn't really make too much difference. You usually assume x1 and t goes from minus infinity to infinity. And, okay, these five, okay, that t equal to minus infinity and plus infinity, they should be backwards. Uh, okay, if you, if you make the analogy with the Schrodinger picture, what we do, we start with x1, t1, x2, t2, these are your limits. So you integrate over all possible values of x. And this x, so you are summing over all paths such that the x, t1, 
is equal to x1 and x t2 is equal to x. So you have here we are there is in, from like to like. So if we calculate this quantity over here somehow, we know that we cannot use perturbation theory, but we should find some other means to calculate this quantity. Then we can calculate the endpoint function, and once we calculate the endpoint function, we are done. Well, that is one of the approaches uh, in many half of time, which I will shortly cover tomorrow. Another approach is ADS CFT. Well, in ADS, well, we should wait like 15 minutes to learn the details about ADS CFT. More of it, more sitting over there and nodding his head, he will be talking about that. It will take more. Hmm? It will take more. What do you mean? More than 15 minutes. 15 minutes of break. Okay, any questions for you? Did I miss the meaning of the journal? It's just something I didn't want. It's called the source part. But I just put it over there. Of course, at the end, I have to set J equal to zero. I have to take these derivatives first for my values of J, and then set J equal to zero. We just, in the QED case, for example, we said that this one point function, one point irreducible function, should be equal to, at Q squared is equal to mu squared, this should be equal to zero. We, in experiments, we measure the value. So if we set this value, we, we make a measurement at mu squared, we measure the value of the, our fine structure constant. So, of mu squared. So if you make a casting experiment, this is alpha of mu squared. Here, this term. Plus I get correction. But I know that this term only is my physical process. So I have to define my normalization such that all these are zero. There are no corrections at scale mu squared. So that amounts to setting this to equal to zero at the scale of squared mu squared. So this, this mu squared is something I choose. I first measure my alpha at, at this scale. And then the question I really ask is, if alpha is, has such a value at that scale, what is its value at some other scale? Then I can write that alpha at any other q squared value is just alpha of mu squared divided by 1 minus i i one part of the reducible of a q squared. And usually, this is not written like this. Usually, rather than writing it in this form, what we write is we consider the derivative of alpha q squared with respect to q squared and multiply it with Q squared so that it will be dimensionless. This is so called the beta function. So this beta function determines how your fine structure changes as you change your scale. Now of course since this mu this mu squared that we put there is our choice kind of the physical properties should not be should be independent of which scale we choose to use our to make these definitions. Well, this is by the way, this is just one way of renormalizing the theorem. This is what we call the renormalization schemes. This is one scheme that you can use. You can, as long as you get rid of the divergences, you can use any scheme that you like. And the results, the physical results, should be independent of the 